All right. Hello, hello, everyone. As you are filing in, I, if you have been joining us for the past three sessions of the day, you already know who I am. But if you did not get a chance to do that, I'll introduce myself very briefly. My name is Adam Sokol. I'm a content marketing lead here at Orem. Extremely excited for this session, joined by Orem founder and CEO Jason Dorfman and Kevin Dorsey, who you all absolutely know already. No uh, introduction necessary there. Uh, we are going to talk about what these two titans of the industry expect for 2024 and, and what we can see happening in the sales space. As I've been doing all day, I'm going to go ahead and open up the chat because I've gotten to do a few sessions with Katie now and I know how much he loves to see where people are from, what they're doing. Uh, so the chat is open, everybody, as you're filing in. Let us know where you are dialing in from, what your role is. Uh, and as we, uh, if you have any questions for these two, please feel free to put them in there. I will track those as we go. Uh, this particular session is called a phone first future forecast. We want to talk about what you both expect to see in the year, what's going to change, what's going to stay the same and what's going to look entirely different. So uh, it would, we'd be remiss if we didn't start with AI, the thing that everybody is talking about constantly. So the first question I have for you both is how is AI going to change business in 2024? And uh, Katie, I will let you start the conversation here. I mean, I think we could do a full hour on how I think it can change business. I actually think a lot of it is going to be, I'll say either driven by or limited by our imagination of how we can apply it. Um, and it's actually a place, you know, we we're talking in the prep for all this. It has surprised me a lot that I actually don't think enough revenue leaders are really starting to understand its use cases, which is leading to a lot of, I'll say, lackluster applications like, oh, like, hey, write this email and then the email comes out bad or whatever else. So like, I mean, I believe it will impact business in terms of education. I think we can teach people faster. I think it will impact business in terms of how we can educate our customers because access to information is now easier. It used to take years to learn all the trends and insights of an industry. Now you can learn it very quickly. The gathering information, like the crafting of messaging, like the support of individuals, I use it in my onboarding. Like I think there's so many applications where it will change business, but you have to be very intentional with how you are applying it. And I think that's where I'm seeing a lot of leaders and companies kind of miss right now. There's not being creative enough they're not looking at it from all the different ways you can actually do something jason what do you think yeah absolutely i mean ai is going to affect that the way salespeople work the way businesses work um i think on the business side and the vendor side i um i draw a parallel to cloud computing although i think this is more substantial than that where all of a sudden you had access to compute and storage on tap now you have access to cognitive intelligence on tap, and that's going to be interweaved into all the different applications that are out there. But what I think is different about this compared to sort of the cloud computing revolution is now individual users have access to the power of this directly as well. And I think that's really powerful. And um, I know Katie said something like this in the, in the past, but in many ways, what AI already does today is um, underused. I mean, there's so many applications with where the technology is at. So a lot of people are talking about all these crazy future use cases. But, um, you know, if you go into chat GPT and, and Dolly today, there's a ton of different things you can do. I guess just one example is we had a, uh, we had a leadership meet, meet up where I was going to put together um, like a collaborative like SWAT session. And it basically built the entire thing for me, all of the handouts, everything like that. I did a presentation uh, yesterday, where I was talking about my grandfather, who's a salesperson, I was able to create images and artwork for my presentation, um, like telling that story. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but the um, when you have access to that type of intelligence, like the amount of use cases and things you can do are endless. It's not just, hey, spit out this email for me. So um, we're going to see a lot of creative things over the next uh, year, definitely. I, I really liked uh, how you're both talking about, like, really the the limit is your own creativity, but it's also just the understanding of how powerful it can be. Katie, uh, Katie, I know you've, you've talked a lot about this is like a huge chasm between what organizational leaders understand about AI and what it can actually do. So how does that chasm affect enablement? And then how can people close that gap? I mean, a huge way it affects enablement, right, is if the, let's call the CRO or the VP doesn't know the capabilities that actually can't give the instructions to enablement, 
on what needs to be done or what needs to be enabled, right? We don't even like think to ask the questions there. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, who's responsible for understanding how your team can leverage this? In my opinion, that is my responsibility. It is my job to understand the capabilities of the technology out there so I can think of the use cases for my teams able to apply it. But right now what's happening is there's there's that gap where the VP or the CRO or CEO doesn't really understand. So enablement's out there trying to figure something out. So they run some sort of training for the reps, but they never actually got trained on it. And there's just, it, that's I, what we saw, right? The usage of like ChatGPT cloud was like massive at the beginning. Everyone was talking about it, even in sales. And then you've actually seen this like decline over the last four to six months because a lot of people tried it, but they didn't get what they wanted out of it because they didn't learn, excuse me, didn't learn it. And so, I mean, I've spent this entire year like hours and hours and hours trying to learn and understand how to write prompts. I've bought two or three different courses on it. I'm watching this, you know, Saturday morning, Sunday morning on YouTube to try to understand the different ways to do it. And so like I, I leverage this heavily with my enablement orgs, building the training plans, building the decks, building the certifications, right? So then once we build the deck and build the training, I can take the recording of the session, transcribe it, upload it, get it summarized off that summary, create a quiz, get the quiz to create the certification. Now within one hour of training, I've got the deck, the summary, the quiz and the certification questions for my team to follow up on. Like it's that level of use case that I think can be done on the enablement side that most people aren't doing and they're not capturing. And I will throw this out. Like this is some of the fun stuff I've been building with like the custom GPTs is to help guide that like to ask the questions. I've built a scorecard builder, a prompt builder, right? A value prop builder where it'll guide you through like how to do these things. And it's making the enablement team's job so much easier. I, yeah, Jason, we didn't kind of have to talk about this, but I know you you walked me through, it, you know, Katie talking about how he's sort of using it from an enablement standpoint. I know you've got like, use, use cases you're really excited about in how you can use it from a, a training and kind of learning standpoint with role playing, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely things you can do with role playing. Um, the the use case that Kevin mentioned as well. I've done different versions of that. Like you take a company's 10K and you upload it, and you then you upload the the champion deck uh, that your champion was using to sell internally, and you try and interweave some of those points. I think like on the enablement front, just with any technology, there's going to be a diffusion of innovation curve, and there's going to be innovators like Kevin that are trying this out and really pushing the limits. Um, and then there's going to be other people that are going to take a long time uh, to catch on, or they might wait until one of the uh, tech vendors um, offers it in a more um, easy to use um, format. So I think you're going to see some companies get ahead, the people that are really leaning into this. And I think there's some people that are going to catch on probably um, in a year or two. Um, but I, I do think that it's important for leaders and enablement leaders to really get in there and try it for themselves. I think Katie said, like, they just go in and try it and then they sort of forget about it. But I think that there's a lot of leaders that haven't really tried it or have only tried it in a very, very surface um, level way. But I'm, I'm sure there's many, many things that I'll look back a year from now and realize, like, why didn't I think of that? Because yeah. part of part of the magic is the... Um, you know, the ability to come up with creative prompts, like for me recently, just the um, like creating images for my presentations have been mm -hmm. really powerful and eye catching. And that's just something that's that's so easy to to do. And before it's like, what would you have to do? You have to hire a designer. I have to ask my designer. I was like, make this custom image for me and wait a week. And then they would have to stop what they were doing. So um so yeah, de definitely some huge benefits there. I want to touch on that one real quick, Jason, because like, and shout out um, to Melissa Gaglione. Like she talked about this a lot. She's a big video proponent. She would make these custom thumbnails for all her videos. Mm -hmm. Now it's so easy to make a custom thumbnail that can like connect the dots between what you're talking about, the problems that they're dealing with, the logo of the company to make this really custom, right? I need an image of a VP of sales that works at Aura frustrated over the fact that he can't seem to book enough meetings over the phone. And I want, and you can create and use their logo and our logo and how like, boom, custom thumbnail. You can use an email on socials for your videos. Like there's so, there's so much that you can do if people really just start to get creative with it. Absolutely. And 
I, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to, you know, obviously people listening in if you're familiar with Orem, you know, we are big, big believers in cold calling. We love having those conversations. I know KD, you are huge when it comes to being on the phone as well. I want to get both of your takes on if you foresee AI impacting sales and cold calling in the future months. And Jason, I'm gonna start with you. I'm sure it's a very relatively simple initial answer with a much bigger tail. So, you know, how do you see AI impacting sales and cold calling? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, this was obviously at the core of, you know, why and when we started Orem was using AI to make this process much more streamlined and a lot easier. And one of the interesting things about Orem is our place in the stack. We have all of the conversations going through our system and the people that benefit from AI the most are the people that have all of the data. So one of the things we do obviously is like AI objection detection or doing automatic note taking or pre-call research. So um, for us, we're in a really good position to now leverage some of the out of the box tools um, that are out there. But in terms of how I think AI can um, impact cold calling, I do think that there's um, a potentially negative um, effect of this as well. Like um, one of the things I worry about is like the aspect of proof of human um, currently like doing outbound calling where AI is imitating a human isn't um, a legal thing because it's a, it's effectively like a robo call. But I think that there's going to be actors out there that are going to do this anyways to scam people. Um, we we focus on uh, business business to business mostly, but I think that you're going to see, um, you know, potentially some of these business to consumer scams using AI. I think that's a, that's a whole other side of AI is like creating phishing scams um, via email. And so I, I worry about that um, impacting uh, trust. So I think one of the things that, that we have to think about in sales is, um, you know, our goal at Orm is to empower the sales rep. Like our whole thesis is like, we want to create almost an old school human to human connection. And we want to bring that back. And I hope some of the, the, the bad sides of AI don't impact that, but that may also be an opportunity to, to do things with technology to show that, Hey, I am a human reaching out. I am a personal connection um, at this company. And I'll, I'll add to that, right? Because to me, it's an opportunity for those that learn the skill of cold calling to really stand out, not just now, but when it does actually get even more tightly regulated, where like you have to be a human and that is known and you actually have to be good at it. What we've seen so much is that people have kind of gotten away from the skill of cold calling. Now, this is a skill. This is something you need to learn and be good at. And what I think is going to happen is a lot of this is going to get automated. You're going to have like these bots. So we, the humans, are going to continue to get worse at cold calling. And then when all of that gets like chopped and shut down, it's like, oh, wait, now this is the only way I can stand out is over the phone. And we've forgotten that skill. I think this is a, such a great time to really be investing in the skill of cold calling because at the end of the day, it is going to get to a point where like it's going to have to get regulated at some point on the outbound side, especially into the B2B space where it's like, all right, like this is a person I can have a conversation with you to like learn this skill because it's, you know, AI is already impacting it. But also I'll just call this out as a pro is, you know, Jason was mentioning it just to have quick access to information. Right. Like I, I always, you know, I bring this up with companies all the time because we drastically underestimate the amount of stuff reps need to remember to do their job well. Like how on earth are they supposed to remember all the insights from that 10K plus the top 10 objections they're supposed to handle with these two types of personas while they're calling, whereas AI makes the consolidation of that information easier and faster. It could be happening right on that call to say, oh, like this is what's happening. Be ready for this. So I think there's a lot of places AI is going to help the cold caller as well when it's applied the right way. Yeah, we got an interesting comment in the chat where someone basically said, you know, they caution against AI calling. Their clients have already caught on to bots on calls and, and called out those companies for using it. And if they do it again, basically, it'll be, it'll be optimized out. And, um, you know, we've we've had a lot of discussions uh, internally here at Orem about the fact that, like, like, like you said, Katie, we we use AI to empower our reps and to make sales more human, like which I know can sound ironic. Oh, you're using artificial intelligence to make it more human. Like, yeah, we we want to make the process as seamless as possible so you can have more of those conversations. But you know, the 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 truth is like that's not what's happening across the market. So you know, for for both of you and, and Jason, I'll start with you. Do you see AI as augmenting or replacing sellers in the coming months and years? 
Yeah, that been asked this question a lot. So, you know, again, our mission at Orm is to empower salespeople. And like one of the tools we do that uh, we use for that is is artificial intelligence. Um, I think it's really easy to look at the power that AI has today, extrapolate it out five, 10, 15 years ago. Well, surely all of these jobs will be replaced. Um, I'm not convinced it's it's quite as simple as that, although I'm sure we'll replay that clip in 15 years and maybe maybe I'll be wrong. But I, I think that it goes back to what is the purpose um, of a salesperson? Like to me, it's people want to have a relationship with a human being at the company because people buy from people that they like and that they trust. And there's going to be a lot of AI tooling that's going to assist with that. But I don't think that AI um, will ever replace that. One, one of the analogies I've used is, when the internet came about, people said, why do we need salespeople? You can just find out about the product online. And obviously salespeople still exist. And I think it's for the reason that I'm mentioning is that you still need someone to um, be the face of your company, to build trust, to build relationships. And I'm hoping that AI brings us back to more of an old school place where salespeople get to be salespeople. That's that's the future that I, that I hope for. But obviously as this technology gets more powerful, it's going to replace a lot of the things that we think of as sales that we do in our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, that's my thought on that. I think David Wilkins says back to the future. And <laughs> I, I, I totally, totally agree. Yep. Yeah. Now, like I'll, I'll put it this way, like augmentation at its core in a way is I'll say some level of replacement. Like if one rep now can make a hundred dials weigh in without tooling, they can only make 20. It's augmenting, but it, you don't now need as many to make the amount of calls. But what that allows for is the better people to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. I don't believe, you know, 10 years from now, well, I'm not even going to go there. But over the next three to five years, AI can only replace us if we don't evolve. You know what I'm saying? Like if we don't continue to now get smarter and faster because we have access to these toolings, it will, right? If you're the sales rep out there just sending templated emails, yep, yep, that, that's done. If you are a sales rep that is not providing true connect the dots insights to a, you know, a prospect and actually doing proper discovery and teaching them something, yes, you will. But if you are the type of rep that is learning from AI, which is now making you smarter, which allows you to bring that human element at a better level, it won't. It won't. Not at least for the next three to five. Ten years, a little bit scared. Three to five, it should make us better. But that's that's the problem is if you're relying on AI, you're quite literally handing the keys over. Whereas if you are leveraging AI to say, all right, this is how it's going to make me better, a better seller to my prospect this is going to take you to a whole nother level as a seller. Adam, I just want to add one thing to that. So I was an SDR in 2010 and the way it worked back then is I had, you know, my phone and then I had Salesforce. I would make a call. I would manually log the call on Salesforce. I would then update the status and then you send out a manual email and then you log the email in Salesforce. So like I'd argue that a lot of the things I was doing that I thought were sales were not really sales. They were data entry that are now um, automated. At the same time, you know, there was no such thing as bulk sending of emails and email templates. And I was doing a lot more thoughtful writing than I think what a lot of SDRs do today, too. So I think, um, you know, to Kevin's point, it's really about us evolving as salespeople. But I think that so far in many ways, like I compare that to a rep on Orem today, what the rep it, is doing on Orm compared to what I was doing as an SDR is a lot more like what I think of as sales. Like they're talking to people, they're building relationships. So that's really the future um, that, that I hope for and aspire to. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned Salesforce that just like kind of snapped. There was, they released a report, I think it was last summer. So they basically said that sellers spend 28% of their time actuals actually selling. Like the rest of it is all of that data entry and manual stuff that really isn't part of it. So exactly to, to Katie's point, like if you can leverage the AI to get rid of all that stuff that's taking up all that time, then you can be much more strategic with your calls and with your conversations. And you can actually, you know, get back to the thing that every seller really wants to do, which is have conversations and create those, those human connections. And, you know, a big role, a, a big role in industry and, and companies that traditionally has done that is, is SDRs and BDRs. 
I'm curious for, for 2024 and beyond, I'm asking you guys to put on your, you know, your forward looking lenses here. How do you expect that SDR BDR role to change in 2024? You know, for people that might be a little nervous about it, a little unsure, you know, I love both of your thoughts. We'll start with, uh, with you, KD. Well, I don't, I don't know if I see the role changing as much as like the persona of a great SDR may be changing, right? Like at its core, sales development is about pipeline creation, right? It's the tip of the spear. It's about pipeline creation. And so the role, I don't know that that changes that much. The goal of the role is still the same. I think the types of SDRs, BDRs that are going to succeed is going to change. Right? They need to be able to leverage and apply technology. This is the difference. There was a whole crop of SDRs that came up learning how to use technology. Right, They used the platforms. Now you need to know how to leverage it. Right, like You have the tool and now you need to apply that human element to leverage it and make it better than the tool can be on its own. I do think um, the SDRs, BDRs of the 2024 and the future need to be much better writers, to Jason's point. Like you need to know how to write because not only is this going to impact your emails, but it's going to impact the prompts that you're putting into AI to help craft the messaging that you want and to get the results that you need, right? So you need to be a strong writer. And I'll say more than anything, it, it, it's not push button anymore. You have to really connect the dots between things, right? You can't just use like, you know, especially for calling, which I know we're going to go into deeper, like you can't be using the same message to a Jason as you would to a KD, right? Mm -hmm. That SDR is just following a linear playbook. A linear process is also not going to work. You're going to need to be able to connect the dots better between, okay, I'm talking to this persona in this vertical at this company. Here's my messaging. You have to be able to apply that much faster, right? So I think the role to me, I don't know that is the role itself is changing that mm -hmm. much of the outcomes, but I think the personas and the types that are going to succeed in it is changing. And you know, I'll throw this on at the end, like got to be good on the phone. Mm -hmm. You have to get on the phone. You cannot hide behind sending thousands of emails out every single day. Now, like you have, you have to, we have to get back to, to this. And I think that's maybe one, I don't know if that's a change necessarily, but it should be a change for a lot of orgs is to get better and more comfortable on the phone again. Jason, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with everything Kevin just said. In terms of the role will change this year, you know, even outside of AI, I mean, we're in a very different economic circumstance than we were in 2021. And I think a lot of companies are, they're tightening their belt. They're looking at the ROI of their SDR team. So I think you know, SDRs uh, now more than ever, like they really have to up level their skills. Like there needs to be a great training culture to Kevin's point. I think this was always true. I think just during the ZERP era, companies were really frothy with money and they kind of got away with this. Uh, but like, you need to be a great writer. You need to be a great communicator. You need to be great on the phone. I think that was always true, but I think that the tolerance for SDR teams or companies that are not doing that is much, much thinner now because people are taking a close look at the numbers and they're going, they're going, is this SDR team, are they producing value for me? Are they actually producing pipeline efficiently? Obviously the salaries for SDRs have gone way up since I originally got in the business too. And that raises the bar even further. So there may be a difference between um, what Katie and I would like to see happen in 2024 and what might actually mm -hmm. happen. Um, but what I would like to see happen is um, you know, training culture, people, you know, I, I view SDRs and we'll probably talk about this more later as they're, they're supposed to be junior sales reps. They should be training to be great salespeople. And I think that there's great tools, there's great automation, there's AI that's going to help with everything. But at the core of it, it's what are your writing skills? Like, are you compelling over the phone? Are you fun to talk to? Do you know your stuff? Do you know your product? Um, I think those things, the, the, the economic circumstances are going to, um, amplify that. Yeah, that, that actually made me think of something real quick, Jason, I'll say oh, as a change, SDRs now have to be able to provide value and insights. It could, it used to be a little bit more like, Hey, like have a conversation. Let me set you up with someone 
who could maybe go deeper and give you some value and insights. Now you get that person on the phone, you need to be able to show that you know their industry, the trends, the insights, the pain points, like SDRs now I do actually believe they need to be providing a little bit more value and insights on that phone, right? It, it's like, hey, Jason, you're a CRO. Look, here's the deal. Connect rates have dropped by 50% over the last six to nine months, which is causing most, as like they need to be able to speak the acumen of their prospects. That, that is a shift that I don't think many teams were that focused on before. Value much earlier in the process has to occur. So I'm, I'm curious to get both of your thoughts when it comes to like finding this talent, because you know, we, we released a state of sales development last year. Uh, we blind surveyed a thousand, uh, a thousand different organizations across a bunch of industries. And, you know, they basically told us like their average SDR is in that role for six to 18 months. That was, that was the standard answer. So, you know, even, you know, it's a huge turnover. This is not, I'm not breaking news and this, you know, to say that SDR has a very, very high turnover rate. And, you know, so, you know, finding talent that can be productive really quickly is, is essential. And, and I'm curious what, what you two think about how organizations can find the right talent. We actually, um, and the session we had earlier with some of some more customers, uh, Gabrielle from Maintain X basically said like one of their questions is just like, how would you feel about cold calling every single day? And like she basically gauges whether or not they're going to bring them on just like by their their facial reaction to that. Like just like, OK, if you can't if you can't do it, we're not going to bring you on to do this. So for both of you and uh, Katie, we'll, we'll start with you. Like how can organizations go about finding the right talent for that SDR role? So I'm going to I'm going to flip the question here a little bit. I actually don't think finding talent is that challenging. It's developing talent that I mm. think most of the orgs get wrong, right? When you are trying to find an SDR ready SDR, that is incredibly hard. Like if they've had no experience before and you're like trying to find someone that can after a week and a half step onto the phones and like book meetings in a new industry, new product. Like to me, it's not about finding talent. It's about developing talent. I believe turnover is very high in the sales dev world because most of them are never really taught how to do their jobs well, right? Like we had a lot of SDRs on this call right now. So I'm not going to put people like on blast or to drop it in the chat, but most SDRs when they get onboarded are getting like two weeks, maybe, maybe, right, of training, that training is haphazard, they're shadowing, they get no industry insights, they get no prospect insights, they learn about the product, and then it's like, okay, let's see if you can make it. That to me, that's not a talent problem, that's a development problem, right? And so that's how I look at it. finding people that have the right characteristics to be a great SDR, hard work, empathetic, good listener, per perseverant, resilient, confident, hungry for knowledge, you can find those people, those people. I could go right now downstairs. I'm in Vancouver right now. I could walk on Robson right now. I could find people with those characteristics, just walking up and down the street. Okay? But you need to be trained how to do it. That's where I think most people miss. I think we actually lose a lot of great talent in sales development because they never actually taught how to do the job the right way. So I'll pause there. I want, to, I want to take what um, Katie's saying and, and veer into some other areas as well. It's a topic I'm passionate about because being like the sales tool guy, being the CEO of a sales tech company, you know, SDR, SDR leaders or, or CEOs, they come to me and they go, Jason, like what type of sequence should I build? Like what tool should I buy to like make my SDR team better? And very rarely do I get asked the question of one, how do I recruit the best people into my company? And Two, like, how do I actually train them to be really great salespeople? And I will take the person with no tools that is highly trained and very, very skilled over just like hiring anyone, not training them, and then loading them up with outreach orum and all of these other, all these other things. So, you know, I think the, the team that I built at Rubric, I'm really proud of. And I think that had a, everything to do with the people that we hired and the training. I would, I would depart, um, maybe I'll disagree with, uh, Katie, a little bit about it's easy to find people because I, I I think it's true that there's a lot of great people out there. There's obviously millions of people that are fit to be a sales rep, but I find that the um, in most SDR organizations, the hiring managers are not critical enough. And I think a lot of the best hiring managers 
are actually they're they're very particular and they take the attitude of like oh this person can do it no they go like i want to hire the best possible people because that's going to give you the best chance of success at the end of the day um, i have some thoughts around you know interview questions and things like that one thing i did at rubric is i was using external recruiters and internal recruiters because i wanted a really wide range of people in front of me didn't matter if i spent all my, my whole day on phone interviews like the the broader of a net that i can cast the more likely i'm going to be able to find this um, diamond in a rough and when i'm interviewing um, a lot of times i'm testing for um, storytelling ability like having them give you their life story you can pick up from that subtly whether they are someone that's of high agency that overcomes obstacles um, obviously the stereotype of like former athletes and things like that people who like have you done something that's really really challenging in the past where you came out on top or as number one hiring and getting that dna on board i think is really really important but then once you have them you have to train them I have some um, unique things I've learned there too, not to go on a total tangent, but um, one thing is uh, learning the product. And I, and I find that teams do not, especially when they're selling something technical, if you're selling a technical product and you can become technical yourself, the people on the other end of the line, they're going to pick up on that. It doesn't mean you go into this speeds and feeds feature discussion, but it's really obvious if you're calling into IT or security and you know what you're talking about. So I think a lot of time needs to be spent there. And when someone says, how does this product differ from the competition? What exactly does this product do? Like they have to be able to answer that inside and out. And one of the things we did at Rubrik, which was one of my boss's idea, which I think is really uh, was really powerful and interesting, was a lot of the times you have an SDR and then when they hit the nine month mark or the one year mark, it's like, let's do a pitch contest because maybe you're getting ready to be an AE and we'll bring in the AE managers and the CEO and they'll judge it. We started doing that on the first month. So you start, hey, in one month, you're going to do the full discovery call demo pitch that an AE does. And all of the AE leaders are going to be there and they're going to you know, grade you, judge you. Well, what happens? They go, oh, shoot, this thing's coming up. I need to prepare for this. I need to get really, really crisp at my uh, pitch. And then one of two things happen. Either they crush it and then you can't get the AE leaders off your back because they all want them to be a rep in the field in a few months. Or it's very obvious to everyone that they're not ready yet to be an AE because they flunked the assignment and now they know what they need to learn. So, yeah, I think um, and I think the theme of this discussion is a little bit of like going back to basics, but I believe that great people are rare and you have to try and find those people. And then once you have them, it behooves you not to really train them. People, people are coming from college, they're studying physics, studying, they should know what the IT product they're selling does. Um, like put, put the time in. And so, yeah, that's my, that's my rant on that. But I, I think that's the number one thing that if SDRs leaders can take away from this is focus on those two things above all else, and then buy them whatever tool they want. You can afford any tool once you're, if your rep's amazing, like buying a handful of AI tools out there, no matter what the price is, is going to be a no brainer because you're not going to want valuable talent to, to waste their time. And I do want to be very clear. My interview process is very rigorous. I know the exact characteristics that I'm looking for. We have a rubric around it, all the questions around it. The characteristics are the key. I hire off characteristics for SDRs, borderline 100%. Right? They, these are the characteristics I'm looking for, and we grill on them. Right. I view it as my job to develop an SDR. Right. I'm not looking for much skill coming in. I'm looking for the characteristics necessary. But those those people are out there. They're, they are findable. True story. Four months ago, you could actually ping people on my team. Four months ago, on site here, we went to dinner one night as a team. And I did everything I could to recruit our server to join the company. Yeah. It's, it's funny you bring that up. I was on a sales floor the other day and one of my friends was pointing out someone. They said, we went downstairs to have dinner at the restaurant and he was a great server and we ended up hiring him. So yeah, they, they definitely are everywhere. And um, we have, we have SDRs that come from all different backgrounds. So, well, I think that being a great salesperson is kind of a rare breed, but they are in all sorts of different places. You can find them everywhere. That's for sure. But yeah, the same exact example. I just, I just heard that. That's interesting. Uh that's go amazing. to restaurants, go to more restaurants, eat out more, <laughs> buy good surfers. Yeah. We'll, actually, we'll, we'll keep going here. I'm sorry, Adam. We'll, we'll no, keep you're up. great. So, like, to, especially the sales leaders, it's like, once you know the characteristics you're looking for, you know where to find people with those characteristics, right? I loved, for example, hiring, you know, actors and actresses, 
right? And not for the reason why most people think. It's not because they can put on a persona quickly or whatever else. It's because they are used to rejection. They go to audition after audition after audition, trying out for roles, and they don't get the vast majority of the roles that they get. They know how to take a script and make it come alive, right? I've, they have the characteristics I'm looking for, and they know how to use language the right way. So I, where, where can I go find actors and actresses, right? You talk about people that were in recruiting. You talk about people that were in like true, like rough customer success roles. You know, or like people are calling in and ripping their, their heads off because the T-Mobile T went down or whatever else. Like once you know the characteristics you're looking for, you know where to go find those, especially if you're hiring out of colleges, the, the, you know, the sports teams, the groups, whatever else. Like once you define that, you can go, you can go find them. Mm -hmm. There's a, I, I just want to make sure I can grab this comment for I, the chat's moving along. The, chat, really the great. chat's blowing up. So I think we I'm loving it. it. I, I want to give a shout out to, to Samantha though. She said SDR shouldn't be viewed as an entry level position. They're the initial face of your org. They need to know everything and know how to answer all questions, qualify for sales teams and bridge the gap from marketing efforts. It should be viewed as as important as the sales team. As a marketer who my job is to help people stay on brand and on message every single day, I absolutely love that. We're not going to get into the nuance of what we talked about yesterday, but we had conversations with our AEs and our SDRs yesterday talking about competitors and like these nuanced things that everyone needs to pick up on. I just love that energy of understanding like it's not just off the street, like you have to be dedicated. Sorry, Katie, you go ahead. You got something to say? Well, one to that, but I want to answer Gabe's. I actually saw a question here from Go Gabe's. About what are tech companies looking for in a resume when you apply for an SDR, BDR role? How can you stand out as the best candidate when there are 100 applicants? So I'm going to answer this very directly. I don't even look at resumes. So I should tell you everything that you need to know. Okay. How do you stand out for an SDR, BDR role? Stand out as an SDR or BDR. You know, like perfect example, y'all. I'm hiring for a VP of partnerships right now. I'm hiring for a VP of partnerships. I have gotten over a hundred applications online, over a hundred. You know how many direct outreaches I've gotten so far? And this is from a, from, from a VP level candidates, hundred online applications. Any guesses in the chat real quick, how many like direct outreaches I've gotten so far? The low numbers. <laughs> two. 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 So Gabe, hear me when I say this, it's actually not that hard to stand out if you're willing to do what a good SDR would do. Find the hiring manager, record that video, craft a great message, gasp, find my number and call me and say, hey, I want this role and here's what I've been doing to develop myself to get there. Do what a great SDR would do, right? Because it's, it's just, it's crazy to me that more people don't take this serious when you're trying to get a job. Like this is a multi six figure contract, baby. Treat it like it's a multi six figure contract. Craft that messaging, write a personalized email, draft the video, find my address, do direct mail, like land that six figure job y'all. Like, so I hope, hope that helps game. I hope, I hope that gives some, some direction there. Jason. Totally agree. People don't look at like um, when you apply for a job online, especially a sales job, sometimes they don't even look at that. I mean, why not? Like it's the same amount of effort, probably less effort just to reach out to the person directly. I think it gives you a, a better shot and at least shows uh, the initiative that you can break into an account. I'll just uh, comment on um, on Samantha's post about um, entry level. And I definitely agree that SCR should be very, very high skilled. Um, when uh, I was starting the team at Rubric, my first thought was, well, this will be easy. I'm just going to go to an adjacent company in our space that I, that I won't name and I'll hire the SDRs. There's a bunch of SDRs that have been there for one or two years. They probably already know this stuff. I'm just going to hire them. It will be easy. And I started to interview the people from these other companies that had been in SDR a year or two. And I and I didn't know a ton about their product. I was an IT. I was very, fairly technical. But I spent like half a day just kind of looking through the website, watching a few videos. And then I would ask them, what does the product do? And like, they knew less than what I knew from like looking on the website for 30 minutes. And so I was like, ah. I was like, I can't hire these people. And then I went out and I hired entry level people that were really, really smart. And I was able to train them all on all this stuff really quickly. So from, from my point of view, like, I mean, you know, people and not all SDRs went to college, but if they went to college, they went to school, it's like, they're taking physics classes. Like how long is a quarter? It's like not that long. And like, they're, they're an expert on that subject or they know that really well enough to pass a test. So like, it, it doesn't take that long. I think three, four weeks, you should have some in-depth knowledge about the company and the space so that when you call a prospect, it's clear to them that they're talking to someone that knows what they're talking about. And that's going to give you a huge 
um, a huge leg up. That's the sales training itself is a little bit separate, but just like the product knowledge piece, I think that there's no excuse whether they're entry level or whether they're experienced. Um, I think that it's very possible to make sure that everyone on your team knows that. Hold training sessions, sessions, quiz people, make it a part of the culture, especially if it's a technical product, which I know a lot of SDR leaders are selling in those in those areas. I, uh, I'm laughing because this is like the, the third uh, live thing I've done with Katie. I don't know why I always prep like 20 questions. I know we're always going to just get on tangents. They're going to be way, way better than anything I could have written anyway, which is why I was laughing. I'm loving this. Keep the questions coming in the chat. I, I want to shift gears a little bit with, with both of you. I want to get your thoughts on this because, you know, there's, there's so many different places that people can be messaging and sending out pitches and there's a million different channels and, you know, people are, you know, flooding inboxes. And I'm really, really curious for, from both of you, how can reps in 2024, how can they build genuine relationships with prospects? Like how can they rise above all the different noise this year to actually create those genuine relationships with people that they want to become their customers? I'll, uh, I'll start, you're both giving me the, the thinking face. I'll start with that with you, Jason. I want to get your thoughts. I mean, part of the fundamental job of an SDR is you're trying to get people's attention and you're trying to to pique their interest. So like a good SDR is an SDR that is getting someone's attention and, and getting noticed. And um, some of that is from the hard work of actually picking up the phone and, and reaching out. But I think more importantly, and what I've seen from a bird's eye view at Orem is like the conversion rates like uh, very dramatically. And we have some reps where it's like they get someone on the phone, like half the time they're getting the meeting. And we have some reps where it's like they get a hundred connections and then they can't um, book a meeting. So I think it comes down to those fundamentals, sales skills. When you get that first objection, are you showing empathy? Are you walking alongside them? Are you providing value on that call? Or are you pestering them? You don't know what you're talking about. You're not even sure who you called. And then you get mm -hmm. hung up on. So I think everyone has a different style. Like I I have, I know some reps that are very technical. They build trust that way. I know um, some reps, they, they're really good at the small talk and they're fun to talk to. And like, that's another style that works for um, types of people. So I, I don't think there's any one way, um, one way to do it, but I think it comes down to your fundamental sales skills and whether you're someone that they like and trust enough to take the next step. And then the work leading up to that, to get them on the phone in the first place. Mm -hmm. Katie, what do you think? Uh, I'm glad he answered. I was I was worried he was going to answer it a certain way, and I was going to have to be like full blown disagreement. I was super nervous. That's why I was giving the thinking face. I was like, ah, shit. Like here it goes. I don't love the word relationship in the prospecting world. Because mm -hmm. if you think about like a what a relate like a relationship to me, right, is a long term in, engagement right like you're together for a while you're learning all the nuances you go through the ups and downs together like things like that whereas on prospecting right and so he used it right it's about attention it's about engagement it's about awareness like i would you know the language i like to use is like to me selling in cs really mostly cs is actually true relationship like true mm -hmm. relationship right where like you're kind of stuck with me regardless we're going to figure this out together sales to me is more about the seduction how do i make somebody want this right and so it's not so much about how to build a relationship in in my opinion on the sdr bdr side it's like how do i build curiosity awareness and some some want some desire right and so to build desire you have to know what people want right and if you know what people want that's how you can start to get some of that attention right? Like this is what this type of persona wants. So now I know how to build messaging around some of that to build some of that attention and awareness. So like, you know, I'm not trying to make this, you know, rated R or anything like that, but like, it's more of a seduction to me is what the the prospecting world is about. And don't make this dirty y'all don't don't be like, Oh, I need to seduce my prospects. I'm gonna, I'm gonna unzip my my jack a little bit here. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. It's about knowing the desires of the personas that you are going after and leveraging that information and that type of knowledge into your messaging. So that's one is like build awareness and curiosity, build some of that like desire of like, actually, yeah, like I, I want to learn a little bit more about this. But then the second is like, you have to be multi-channeled. 
Like you got to be multi. Mm -hmm. You can't just be doing a templated email. You can't just be doing social. You can't just be doing phone, right? You can't just be doing like you need to do all of it, right? You need to be doing all of it to really do this and do this well to build that. Because you know, I'm, I'd be curious from you, Jason. Like, actually, let's let's do this. I'm gonna flip this, right, Jason? How could an SDR get your attention? You're a CEO of a tech company. I can only imagine what your inbox looks like. I can only imagine like what would it take for someone to get your attention? And I can share my take as well. It was funny because uh, just before this, the we're at our sales kickoff here in Denver. The RSDR team brought me in and a bunch of the other stakeholders of the company to ask us that exact question. And obviously, as the the CEO, you're sort of responsible for everything, but in charge of nothing, right? So, like the the most likely response is for me to delegate you to someone else. And so, knowing that, I think it's important to upfront um, that objection. I think this works for a lot of different. Um, personas. So I think when you're calling a CEO um, in particular, I think acknowledge up front that it's likely, you know, this particular person named the person, hey, it's Ting Ting on your team, who's head of marketing, who would see the most value from the solution. But the reason I want to get a hold of you specifically was, so at least they know, because like, like if you're pitching me, sometimes I get calls for like, um, it's a financial management platform or it's a DevOps tool. And like my instinct is like, yeah, I don't know that. Like, I'm going to push that to someone. So if you can show that you understand that, that you understand that I'm not going to be the person evaluating your DevOps tool, that builds a lot of credibility because then I know I'm not going to get in this conversation where you're going to be pushing this tool that I don't even understand on me. But the great outcome for that call is for me to like you over the phone here, tell, you know, what you're talking about, understand the value, and then introduce you to the right person on my team that can purchase it. So I think it starts with empathy, kind of upfronting that objection. You're almost always going to get from a CEO, which is like, you're going to get passed down and um, build a little trust uh, that way. And I want y'all to hear what he just said there, right? Because the question actually wasn't even how to book a meeting with you. It was just how to get your attention, how to get your attention, right? He picked up the phone, <laughs> Right. He, he picked up that that cold call. Right. Like my phone doesn't ring nearly as much as my inbox goes nuts every single day. Right. So I'd say phone and video phone and video to me are the it's one of the best converting combos that I see to build awareness. Right. To build awareness. One of our highest producing conversion channels was click to call right? Who's clicking the videos, watching the videos, you're calling them, right? To go through all that and building for an engagement. But like, those are, those are two big, big ways to, to get better attention, to build better awareness. And then to Jason's point, using the like understanding, do not ask a CEO to book 30 minutes of their time on the calendar. Like, no, you have to know what that flow looks like and guide them towards it. Can I add a, a quick caveat to that? So the re and so most companies, I'd say the majority of them, they have like a middle out sales process, meaning they're selling to like a director or a manager, they're building a business case, and then they're taking that up the chain to the CFO or the CEO. There are some cases like a work day, for example, where you're doing very much like a top down sale. But I would say that that is very rare. And there's obviously some product led growth motions where you're going directly after um, the user. So I think understanding that is important. And especially the bigger the organization in any B2B sale, no one person makes the decision. So a very common objection you're going to get is I'm not the right person, like it's someone else. And I think by upfronting that saying, hey, I know that there's other people that are involved in this decision other than yourself, but the reason I wanted to get a hold of you specifically was, and then tailor it to them, I think is really powerful because in the first moments of a cold call, a lot of the times they're trying to brush you off. They're trying to get you off the phone. And if you can acknowledge that this is call is not for you to like buy something over the phone because I'm claiming that you're in charge of X, I think that goes a long way for the prospect to feel like you're a reasonable person and to mm -hmm. maybe trust you enough to take um, that next step. But yeah, definitely don't ask for 30 minutes to show me a DevOps tool. I'm not the right person to evaluate that. But if you play your cards right, I can probably get you get you in the door. Love that. Um, phone, just for everyone, uh, just for everyone in, in the chat hanging out here, I just launched a, a quick poll. We love doing this in our discussion, so we know if you guys actually want uh, a demo, we know who to reach out to. So if you're interested in a demo norm, feel free to click yes on that. I got one last question for you, Jason and KD. Um, you, we've sort of been talking around this a little bit, but you know, if you were an organizational leader looking to grow your business in 2024, while also reducing that customer acquisition costs and churn, you know, what would you focus on that you think most 
leaders are missing. Jason, I'm going to let you start with this and please don't give away too much of our Orem secrets here. But what is, you know, what is the one thing you would focus on if you were looking to grow business in 2024? This is like kind of a hard question to answer, but I think that what a lot of CEOs are thinking about, obviously in this environment, raising money is not as cheap as it used to be. Um, people have to think about the assets that they already have on the books and how to get the most um, out of them. So I think that like most CEOs are thinking about how do I get leverage out of the staff that I have? How do I get leverage out of the tools that I have? Because I think the 2021 era was we can always add, add more spend, add more people. And now I think we have to think about how do we train the people we have better? How do we come up with a better strategy so um, we're more productive? So I think that language is is very appealing to people right now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I have more comment on that. I'll pass it to, to Katie. Maybe I can build off him. I mean, it's uh, like very loaded question. I would say one, I would invest heavily in skill development of your reps and your frontline managers, right? Like because like everyone's talking about like doing more with less. The other way to say that is be better at what you do. And that would change how a lot of people approach this, right? Everyone's saying do more with less. Well, technically that just means being better at what you do. And so investing heavily in the true skill development of your org, right? I'd rather have 50 people operating at 100% skill capacity than 100 people operating at 50% skill capacity. And that's how a lot of orgs were growing. It's like, all right, let's just put people in here and see what happens. So that's one, I'll say, call it outside-ish the box that like invest in skill development and real skill development. Now, just like a little training here or there, but like really invest, really invest into the skill development of your um, reps, but also the leaders. This is important. Like your leaders have to be better as well to reinforce it. So I'd say there, and then it is, it's really, it's looking, I'll go here. It's like looking for your levers. So when you map out all the data of your org, all the data of your company, you're looking for like, what are the levers? Are there any 2X levers? Is there anything that you think you could 2X? Right. That's what I'm always looking for. It's like, where is there a 2X? And once it falls out of 2X, I'm not paying attention to it as much anymore. Okay. Show rate is 70%. Yeah. I might be able to get that to 80%, but that's no longer a 2X lever for me. I'm going to have my directors and managers work there, but damn it, our connect rate is 6%. That's a 2X lever. If I can get that to 12%, whether that's through training or tooling or AI, that's a 2X lever. And if there's no more 2Xs, then I'm looking for my 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. How can I get a 10% lever here, 10% lever here, 10% lever here, 10% there? And then, then I can actually see an overall 50 to 100% increase that way. So taking a little bit more of a metric base, like where are your levers and diving into that, right? As opposed to trying to hit everything. Absolutely. I love the way that you framed it. Be better at, at what you do. And we're at our sales kickoff right now. And it's just, it's been amazing to see just our team there. We're like, gosh, there's so many things that we could be doing today with our own team by, like you said, identifying those levers, changing our strategy. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that's a really uh, great and compelling framing. I love it. Uh, the thing that we use internally is be better or be bitter. You can get better or you can get bitter. It's up to you. Right. Yeah. Shit's hard right now. Let's get better. Let's get better. Right. Because that's what it requires. Right. Full circle back to the top. If we don't get better, AI will re replace us much earlier. If we continue to get better, mm -mm, mm -mm. I'm going to be real hard to catch, Jason. I'm going to be real hard to catch. All right. I'm going to keep getting better at this thing. Man, every time I get to hear Katie talk about stuff, I'm like, ready to just rip, get off the computer and start ripping some cold calls. Appreciate everybody taking the time to come and, and participate in this. I know it's a very, very busy time of year for everybody. We will be sending the on-demand versions of this. You can share them with your teams. Jason, Katie, thank you both so much for your time. This was fantastic. Thanks, right. Katie. Appreciate it. Thank you.